Hello and welcome to the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you're listening to episode number 53, brought to you by Wicked Tree Gear. Today, John and I are catching up and sharing tips for planning out-of-state hunts, everything from locating a piece of land to hunt and e-scouting, and how to plan a great hunt on the cheap. So stay tuned. All right, we are live, and you're listening to another episode of the Truth from the Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. And before we get cracking, let's quick like get into talking about a couple of our partners that help us continue to make this podcast possible. First up and foremost, Wicked Tree Gear, the longest lasting, fastest cutting, toughest tree trimming equipment you've ever used. Simply put, the toughest saws on earth. How tough are they? Tough enough to come with a lifetime warranty. And right now, you are in luck if you go to wickedtreegear.com and place an order. You can use the promo code TRUTH at checkout and get yourself a 20% discount on your Wicked purchase. We're also brought to you by Exodus Outdoor Gear. If you are looking for a trail camera that will could last the test of time, you don't have to replace it every year. Exodus Outdoor Gear trail cameras are your ticket to just that. They've recently come out with the new Trek camera and, of course, have the lift to their second-gen camera, and both are covered by their no-bullshit five-year warranty and their theft policy. So if interested in picking up a new camera, getting prepped for Velvet Fest maybe, visit excessoutdoorgear.com and pre-order uh, or just order this new camera or the lift 2 today and use the promo code TRUTH at checkout and save yourself 20 bucks. We're also brought to you by Tecumani Seed. Everything is bigger in Texas. Going to get a hell yeah, John. Hell yes. <laughs> Every time I say everything is bigger in Texas, I want to say don't mess with F in Texas. But we're on a we're on an F-bomb, free F-bomb streak, so I don't want to mess that up. But no matter if you're in the South, the Midwest, or the Northeast, Tecumani has your food plot seed needs covered see what it did there a little alliteration visit techamani.com and check out their product selector tool to help you pick the right seed for your food plots use the promo code truth at checkout and save yourself 20 percent and last but definitely not least bringing up uh my favorite one of my favorite products which is the uh the body bag which is also known as the appropriate name, the Ice Bag. Simply the world's finest glacier coolers. Whether you're hunting, camping, or fishing, you'll enjoy smarter design, stronger construction, and superior insulation of glacier coolers. Visit them at GlacierCoolers.com, and like everything else, if you use the promo code TRUTH, you will save yourself 20% on a purchase. So I am, all, as always, joined by my esteemed colleague, hailing from Con- the great state of Kentucky, which you're probably just about ready to get into your prime, man, with March Madness coming up. Johnny Utah, what's going on, man? What's happening, brother? You know, hang, hanging in there, man, trying to get over this. Uh, I'm not going to lie, dude. I, we were talking a little bit before we got on here, and uh, I might be high on NyQuil, to be honest with you. So, I, <laughs> Just I, a, a disclaimer. Yeah, there dis- might be some intoxication via NyQuil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if anything kind of slips out that's weird, I'm just going to blame it on the NyQuil. Um, if anything <laughs> comes out that's like somewhat politically correct, I'll probably own that because I'm usually that way anyway. Uh, but if if challenged, I'll blame it on the NyQuil. Um, there's, I don't know, man. I was thinking, as anytime I take NyQuil, I always think back to, I don't know if you're a big comedian fan or not. Are you? A big what fan? Comedian fan. Like comedian. Stand, oh, yeah, yeah. Stand-ups. I like comedians. I like okay. to laugh occasionally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fun, funnies are good. Um, when I was a kid, I was all into like the Andrew Dice Clay uh, okay. CDs. I was all into um, you know the Jerky Boys stuff. I was all into yeah. They were funny. Yeah, I was all into like my cousin got me into even like the early Eddie Murphy on cassette. You know, whenever he did like the mm-hmm. Mr. T skit and stuff like that. And then one of my favorite was Dennis Leary in like the mid '90s like CD that came out. And he has this whole yeah. skit that he does on Night Quill talking about how it's the thirteenth. Oh, I almost dropped an F bomb there. The thirteenth F and step of your twelve of your twelve step program recovery. He's like, it's the hidden step. Nobody knows about it. He's like, it's Night Quill. He's like, are you drunk? I'm like, no, I got a cold. So you could totally get away with it. <laughs> so yeah. I think of that every time I take Night Quill and go to work because I'm kind of all buzzed up. And you're like, you're just kind of walking around. And if anyone challenges you, it's like, nah, man, I'm not high. I'm just I'm on, I'm on Night Quill. I got a cold. Yeah, that's all it is. Yeah, no big deal. How many times? So let me ask you this, man. As a as a as a former uh, cop. Have you yep. ever had anyone use the man? I just took a bunch of night quill excuse for some type of uh, you know intoxicated driving. Oh yeah, oh yeah, man. I've 
I, I've I literally heard it all. I've heard uh, I took one too many vitamins. Um, <laughs> I mean, I've heard all kinds of stuff. You know, syringe in the arm, and they were like, "Yeah, it's it's my Sudafed. It does this to me all the time. It has me on the nod." I'm like, "Come on, seriously, Dude, that is that is something Seen special." So let me ask you this. So I always heard, you know, this this is a nice like true confessions of a, for a, of a under or former undercover. So mm-hmm. does the penny under the tongue thing actually work for pa- passing no. a breathalyzer? No, no. Okay, that's good to know. No. So, yep. like, I mean, we could probably stop the podcast right there. We just passed off really good information to people that know yeah. that does not work. So whenever you're leaving deer yeah, camp. Just like, don't even try it. Yeah. yeah. Only thing you're going to have is a nasty copper taste in your mouth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's yeah. not, that's not, that's not um, good. No, it's, uh, yeah, that's one of those that can definitely be uh, debunked. Um, yeah, when you're drunk, you're drunk. You know, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> and, you know, and and I guarantee you somebody's listening. And like, no, I tried it, or my buddy did it. It worked. No, your buddy lied to you to, to tell a cool story. It didn't right. work. Your buddy lied to you, and he ate a penny. So because you're drunk and you didn't realize you had a penny in your mouth, you probably swallowed it. So there's also <laughs> right. that. You know, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> nice. So yeah, so I'll uh, I'll apologize in advance for any coughing fits that I have. Uh, but you know, moving our uh, conversation upward and onward uh, to more deer hunting related things, I know that we both had an opportunity to get out uh, this past week, and it's kind of nice for, for you know an opportunity for you and I just to kind of catch up. You know, we we, yeah. we we of course trade a lot of texts during the course of the week and stuff like that. You yeah. know, or during the course of every week. But, you know, as I've mentioned in the past, a lot of times the only time we get to actually get on the phone with our busy lives and schedules and stuff like that is actually when we record our podcast. This is our catch up time. So today yeah. we're bringing all of you just into the fold of the John and Clint catch up. So, man, I know when we texted last week, first off, I know that you went and did a cool thing, if I'm not mistaken, with Don Higgins, uh, with his crew. Yep. Um, and if, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, it was in Kentucky. So can you tell me what that was? Because it was it was a benefit of some sort, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, Real World is a is a sponsor of the Arrow Wild Web Show on the mineral and and their feed side, and that whole relationship came about. I've known Don and Kevin and Terry for for quite a while. Um, you know, Don Higgins. If if anybody's not familiar with Don Higgins, um, if you if you've read a deer hunting magazine at any time in the last ten years, you've probably seen an article that he's written. Um, Super, super intelligent guy coming off of one hell of a season this Dude, year. I he mean, ha- he's had like a season for like multiple centuries. Oh, we, yeah. Yeah. And in, we should totally try to get that guy on. In five days, he killed over 400 inches of bone. Yeah, it's it's nuts, man. On two different farms in Illinois. So, phenomenal year. But, you know, with their real-world product, um, I got to actually do a little bit of testing on some of the early versions of their Maximizer Mineral uh, back in 2015. And they've continued to tweak it and tweak it and tweak it. Um, and now with their expect healthy deer technology they've got on it, and they had some case studies that came back from the university, I believe it was Minnesota, um, with some very favorable results in regards to EHD bucks. And once that information came out, I'm just like, hey, I don't care what we do. I'm using your mineral whether we have an official partnership or not, I'm, I'm going to use it. But we got everything worked out, and so using their products this year, um, huge, huge fan like you and I both. I mean, we're constantly trying to find what's the best thing out there, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, especially whenever it's healthy for the deer. But several months ago, uh, Terry uh, Terry Peer is their marketing guy. He had approached me and said, hey, we're uh, putting together this fundraiser, and Don and Kevin are going to be there, and Don's going to give a talk, and – and all the books that he sells, he's donating to this fundraiser. And it was a hunter, a hunters for Haiti nice. event. And, um, you know, there's a lot of times where people will do fun, special fundraisers where they throw an injection of money into, you know, let's say they, there's a disabled person or a war veteran and, and they, they buy them a house or, you know, something. And that's awesome. Um, they're, they took it a step further. And instead of just buying the person the house or building them a house, they're having local contractors build the house. So That's now cool. you're boosting the economy all the way around, you know? Yep. Um, so they raise enough money on just ticket sales alone. They raise enough money to build one house 
And I believe after the silent auction, they had enough money to build another house, if not two more. Wow. Um, so anyways, they, they asked me to come down and I had been at the Iowa deer classic on all day Friday and drove back from Des Moines to Southeast Iowa, slept for about five hours, packed a bag and, um, and then got to drive down there, drove, drove back to Northern Kentucky and, and, and participate in their fundraiser. Um, and it was, it was amazing. I mean, they had over 250 people that showed up, um, to help support the event that came there for the, we had a, a chili dinner and listened to Don Higgins talk. Um, people were buying items, $200 items. People were paying $300, you know, cause they yeah. knew that it was, they were buying a $200 item and making a $100 donation. So it was uh, super cool to see hunters participate in something like that. And, um, you know, egos checked at the door and everybody was just the camaraderie of hunters, you know, helping somebody else other than themselves. So it was nice to see. Yeah, man. It's a, uh... It's funny. I'd love to have Don on sometime and just talk to him because it's. I mean, he's got a lot. Of, of course, the dude's a like a master, you know, big buck slayer, you know, which is oh, un- unreal. Yeah. The year he had this year, um, but I've had an opportunity to read some of his stuff. I mean, as you as you had mentioned, super smart guy. Did learn a little bit about what you were talking about with some of the studies and stuff that had come back, and I'm super interested to kind of hear more about that and more about you know the the. the I guess the the mineral and stuff that he's putting out that can kind of help with the 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 health of the deer herd and stuff like that. It's super interesting stuff. And I mean, if he's you know if he's come up with something that can kind of help turn back the clock a little bit on you know EHD you know on you know herds that are using it to any degree. I mean, that's just I mean that's awesome. You know, I don't sure. There, there's nothing more much more that you can say about that. But then I think mm-hmm. also it's like I follow him of course on on social media and what I really appreciate about, appreciate about him is that the guy's a straight shooter. You know what I mean? It's like yep. he, he doesn't mince words, um, but and he and he's kind of stoic a little bit, at least from what I gathered from him, like the things that I've read and the speaking I've heard him do or videos I've seen him on and stuff like that. But what people sometimes don't recognize is the dude. It's like and I can tell this just from like afar and you can probably confirm this for me, but it seems like the dude just has like a heart of gold. Um, you yes. know, there's like there's, a, there's almost like this tough like ex- exterior a little bit. And that's just like his personality. But the dude mm. is just genuinely, it seems like a nice guy that wants to help people which is just like add all those things up like killer deer hunter um, doing good things for you know uh deer herd and the betterment of of, of deer management and helping deer managers and then he's a a nice dude it's dude that's the triple threat right there he's he's the justin timberlake of the deer world deer world (laughs) (laughs) he and i guarantee you don higgins doesn't know who justin timberlake is. yeah i know um, (laughs) once explained i'm sure he would appreciate that (laughs) right exactly uh, you, you hit the nail on the head i mean he's one of those guys that it's intimidating like every time i talk to him i'm like intimidated because he doesn't say much Mm -hmm. um he doesn't crack a smile much um you're right very very stoic uh very set in his ways um but the common ground is you know he absolutely loves whitetail and whitetail management um and he loves trump so um you know that's uh that's two bonus points so we're good right (laughs) all good in the hood um that's right so I want to touch on, you know, so one, I, th- I think it'd be awesome. We should definitely try to get, get him on sometime. Cause I think I would definitely oh, yeah. be intimidated to inter- interview that guy, um, you know, or have him yep. on the show, you know what I mean? Cause it's like, man, what am I going to say? It's going to be just completely dumb and he'll tell me about it, you know? <laughs> like, yep. so. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, he's one of those guys too, that, you know, you can't just pull his string and he goes, yeah. um, you know, like remember some of those old video games back in the day? Where, um, like, they would only answer a question if you uh, asked yeah. uh, the right question. Yep. Um, like, he's that guy. Like, yeah. he will only give an answer to what you ask. He's not just going to go off on a tangent for three hours and yeah. and tell you the mysteries of white-tailed deer. Right. Um, you got a mind for but, that uh, shit. That's right. Ain't, got, ain't nobody got time for that. Um, right. But... Yeah, he's uh, he's fun and and I tell you and you know his business partner Kevin equally is a super 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 smart guy. You know, he doesn't r- do as much of the writing stuff mm-hmm. uh, like Don does. So I think Don gets, you know, um I don't know if this is the right way to say it. Sometimes maybe like cast a shadow a little bit, you know. Right, right. Um but whenever you sit down and talk with Kevin about land management and consultation on you know, hinge cutting and habitat improvements and bedding locations and that kind of stuff and food plot locations um that dude's sharp right yeah he's I mean, pretty dang sharp too you know right. so it's, um 
they're a good combination. Right. It's a hard not to cast a shadow when you slay 400 inches of bone in like seven days. That's right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so it is what That's it is. That's a big shadow. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, man. So it's, it's neat. Like I said, it was it was cool to get back home. Uh, you know, I, it was literally an overnight trip. I didn't get to catch up with, the, with a bunch of old friends and stuff like that. Um, I usually save that for like during turkey season or something like that. Right, which is fast approaching, of course. But I know you were. Uh, yes. I know you were picking up some stuff while you were down there too. Some you were going to be have your truck loaded down. So I just want to know, like, did, <laughs> oh were, were, gosh. Were, were you on the two wheel motion? Did you have your gangster? Dude, wing? I will never do that ever again. So, <laughs> um, like, it, and you know, you you already know about it. But for everybody listening, um, I thought, you know what, I'm going to be down there. Um, they were like, Hey, we're bringing a big trailer with a bunch of mineral and feed and stuff. Like if you want, we can go ahead and bring you the stuff that you need, you know, for the year. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? Yeah, sure. I said, what's it, what are we talking? I, and I threw out kind of a dollar amount kind of that I wanted to pick up and they're like, yeah, it's about a pallet. And I'm like, yeah, you know, half ton truck, you know, no big deal. I'll get a pallet. It ends up being almost two pallets. I had like 500 something pounds of mineral in the front seat front passenger seat i had two bags on the armrest or which became my armrest right um probably six seven hundred pounds in the back seat and then the rest was completely overfilling overflowing the bed of the truck so i had my eight and a half hour drive well should have been an eight and a half hour drive almost took me 10 to get back to southeast iowa man Um, I will never, ever, ever, like, do that. That was, like, the most horrible ride ever. Oh, yeah, because that's a smooth ride, too, and you get all that, you know. Oh, dude, I'm telling you, every bump I hit, I'd hit, like, a pothole or a bridge overpass, and I'd still be filling it in the truck for, like, a quarter mile. (laughs) Yeah, man, I bet you, I bet you the, uh, I bet you your suspension is looking pretty sweet right about now in the old, yeah, the old truck. Yeah, yeah. As soon as I pulled in, I came inside the house, and my wife's like, "Oh, hey, you're back," and I'm like, "Yep, uh, throw on a coat and boots and gloves. Come on, we got to unload the truck <laughs> right before the pot tires fall off this thing." Yeah, yeah. my tires are screaming right now. <laughs> nice, but hey, I know while you were down there, man, you and I did get a chance to talk since you did have your your long ass ride. It's that's actually whenever yeah. I mentioned up front, whenever we don't talk very often on the phone, other than the podcast. Cast, we text a lot. I know, yeah. We we talk usually when one of us has a long drive. That's usually when one That's of us right. calls the other one. It's like, dude, I got like three hours yeah. to kill. I got to call somebody. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I know when we were talking, man, you shared some pretty exciting news with me. And then you were going to do so. Let's talk. Let's do two things. One, we'll talk about your scout in Kentucky second, but let's talk about like okay. the lead into why you were doing the immediate scouting you were, were doing in Kentucky. Yeah. Um, so. What I've when, when I when I left Kentucky, I, I never wanted to just leave Kentucky. You know what I mean? Right. Um, Kentucky is my roots, and and that's where I started deer hunting. So, um, Kentucky holds that special place. Well, since I've moved away, um, the first year that I moved away, I went back to Kentucky and I hunted. It was unsuccessful. I was down there for one particular buck, and it just didn't pan out. Uh, passed a couple of decent bucks, and the buck I wanted just didn't quite give me the shot that I needed. I saw him and, um, one reason or another, it, it didn't, it didn't end up happening. And my goal was a velvet buck. And here's a little known fact. Um, I've never shot a velvet buck before. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of weird because Kentucky is one of those early season States, right? But it used to not be as early. Um, I've shot bucks on September 11th before that were hard horned. Oh, wow. Um, As time has gone on, the Kentucky season has gotten a little bit earlier uh, since I moved away. We had a September 3rd one year. Um, Last year might have been September 2nd, but nonetheless, this year is September 1st. Is that is a Saturday. So Hmm. um, I've been doing the Montana thing. And I really like to go to Montana antelope hunting that first week of September. Well, I got the antelope last year, and I was like, man, maybe I ought to go back to Kentucky and do it do an every other year. Do every, you know, do one year Kentucky, the next year Montana, and then, you know, keep flopping back and forth. Um, so I decided, you know what? I'm going to go back and with the early, early season, there's a better opportunity for me to go back and try to try again for a velvet buck. So this year, uh, I'm going to start my early season. I'm going to go back to Kentucky and, um, 
possibly be doing a little project with Sitka um, on that nice. hunt. So going to try to work out the details uh, on that and get all that wrapped up. But even if that doesn't um, come to fruition, I'm still going to still going to go back to Kentucky. So knew, knowing that I was going to be there anyways for this event, I thought here's a great opportunity for me to go back and try to do a little shed hunting and do a little scouting. It's been two years since I've been on this property and kind of just check out things, see if anything's changed and and whatnot. Um, ironically, this is the same property that I do go back to every year and spring uh, turkey hunt. So, so it's not anywho, like you, it's, it's got, not like you haven't been on it. And yeah, have, you know, have have been walking around. So it's not like it's yeah. know, starting from scratch yeah. necessarily. Yeah, yeah. Right. So um, uh, got to go back and uh, we hit we hit a bunch of open fields. Like I said, I know that I'm going to be back down there in about a month uh, and a half or so. Um, for turkey hunting so i'll i'll tr- you know go back and probably do a little bit more shed hunting and stuff but um and some more scouting but we went uh i met up with my old camera guy um and he's also a field producer on arrow wild my buddy mike riddle and um so we went and kind of scouted around a little bit and checked out the property and confirmed that it's the same way it was when we left it last time <laughs> and uh of course you know you start what about that tree? Oh, I wonder, I wonder if we can get a, you know, we got to get a tree stand in that tree kind of stuff. So that kind of kicked in and, and it was, it was fun. So I am looking forward to going back to Kentucky kind of not to sound cheesy, but it's where it all started, you know? Right. Yeah. No, that's awesome, man. I know whenever we were talking, you were super pumped to go back. Um, I would love to try to hunt velvet bucks. It's one of, one of the things that's in my plans for this year is like you had just mentioned, it's like, you know, I went to Montana last year, you know, I'm really kind of on the fence about it this year. I've kind of, I'm probably 85% certain that I'm probably going to skip Montana this year only because I've got some domestic things I should probably be around the house for or around or near or closer to home and not be gone on the other side of the country for, for two weeks. So I'm, I'm really considering a, um, a, an early season whitetail hunt to try to try my luck at a, at a velvet buck. Um, not a hundred percent sure. So that's always been something that's kind of been on my list of things, things to do. Um, which man, I'm so, so, so that is cool enough in, unto itself. Right. So I was already kind of jealous cause I was like, you know, I may or may not get to go try to get a velvet buck this year. And then you tell me the <laughs> second part of this conversation during, during your drive, uh, down to the, to the event in Kentucky and just share yeah. with folks to this, the second part. Cause I was like, you gotta be effing kidding me. I was like, this is driving <laughs> like, so yeah, I was, well, I was peanut butter and jealous right after this next piece. <laughs> Well, and that's the thing, because, you know, we, we talked about this like a month or so ago, mm-hmm. and I'm like, yeah, just, you know, uh, don't know about Montana, haven't decided, but looks like pretty much just Iowa this year. I'm just going to focus right. on whitetails in my home state here of Iowa, and that's it, you know? Right. Um, and then every, you know, some things kind of fell into place, and some things happened, and it's like, wow, you know, the, the season's filling up quickly. Um so when my business partner and I, whenever we sold Wicked Tree Gear to to Tecumani, um, you know Tecumani's home office is you know based out of the San Antonio Kerrville, uh, Texas area, and Tecumani Holdings has the Bucks of Tecumani TV show and and stuff that they operate of mostly there in Texas and uh, Southern states. But um, one of one of our uh, uh, one of our owners. Um, he has a humongous, I mean, humongous farm, you know, you and I, we think of like a hundred acre, 200, 300 acre, 400 acre. Those are ginormous farms in the Midwest and you know, right. in the Northeast. Um, that's like a subdivision lot, you right. know, for some of those guys down there, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, exactly. um, this thing's like 15, 16,000 acres or something, you know, big, big piece. But anyways, we were talking at the shot show and. And, and I kind of made a joke. I said, uh, I said, well, you know, what, what's a guy got to do, um, to let, you know, let his boss, you know, come down to Texas and hunt sometime. And, uh, he's like, do you, do you want to? And I'm like, well, do you have any properties that aren't high fence? And he said, well, yeah, I'm not fencing off 20,000 acres. You know right. what I mean? Um, so he's like, yeah, I, I've got properties, some hill country properties that, you know, that aren't, aren't high fence. And I said, are the, you know, you got any bucks on them? Are they, are they huntable? And he's like, yeah. Like, do you want to come? And I went, uh, like, like does a bear shit, you know, bear shit in the woods. Like, right. are, you, are you serious? So, uh, I said, dude, I've, I've never hunted Texas before. And he's like, well, just let me know. Come on down. 
you can have at it. Uh, so he invited me to come down to Texas. So it sounds like I'm going to be heading down to Texas for a hunt this year. Um, and he's like, well, just let me know. And I'm like, okay, yeah. Like walking away from the conversation, all like, you know, savvy and like, yeah, yeah. You know, I'll, I'll have my people call your people. Right. And then and by like, your right people away, call I was talking my, to a buddy of mine lives in Alabama and I'm like, so when do you hunt Texas deer? <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like when's the rut? Is that like in late December or January or something? You know what I mean? Right. Like I literally know nothing about it. So I think what I'm going to do is, um, you know, we have the shotgun season in Iowa mm -hmm. and as a bow hunter, you can't bow hunt during shotgun season. And, and, you know, as most people know, I don't hunt with guns. Um, so that being said, um, I'm going to probably go down there during that shotgun season because uh, there's nothing else I can do here but twiddle my thumbs and worry about, um, you know, neighboring farmers and hunters killing my deer. <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. Man. That's Dude, that's, man, that's awesome, dude. Like, I'm seriously, like, well, there was like three seconds of jealousy, but I was super pumped for you because that's one of those things where it's like, you know, you're, I remember we were talking exactly what you had said where you're just kind of planning to be in Iowa and yeah and then all of a sudden like i get a phone call and you're like dude i'm doing this and i'm probably going to do this and i'm like dude get out like what happened i talked to you like last week and you were, you were I know, be in Iowa I know. The whole time. yeah it's just weird um and I, i'm sure know, i'm sure he'll have like some hammers on that property too i have no doubt i i, I have no idea i have no i i know nothing what i don't know anything to expect um i know that it's not going to be like hey sit in this tree stand because there is no trees so right. it's literally going to be like, I'm probably going to ship a couple of ground blinds down there um, and probably go and try to brush in some blinds and, and, and go at it. Um, I'm Dude. not expecting a whole lot. I've, I don't know anything about, you know, Texas hunting, Texas style hunting. Um, one thing I have heard is that the deer are very, very, um, uh, they respond very well to a lot of calls and yeah. a lot of rattling. Uh, it seems like that's one place where I've, I've heard of rattling working high, high success rates. Yeah. So, um, you know, maybe that might be a tactic down there, but I probably need to, to brush up on my, uh, Southern hunting a little bit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it might be a good time. I have a buddy that I've been talking to. He's from Texas and he's, he's mm -hmm. wanted to come on the, the show and just kind of share some, some Southern love. Um, so it might be a good yeah, time to have, awesome. have that guy on and, you know, be able to kind of share some Southern information for all those folks out there, you know, listening. But then also the, the nice added bonus is selfishly, we can get you some, some Intel before you, uh, before yeah, I'll you be sitting there south. with pen and paper the whole time. Taking <laughs> yeah, notes. Exactly. It's like, Hey buddy, why don't you give me your, your phone number? We'll do some texting too. I'll, I'll ping you any questions I have afterwards. Um, yeah, but I think that's a good segue. Well, and I'm sorry, go ahead. There's one, there's one more little, little little piece here too oh uh, do i not know this one is this new information for i me? don't think you do oh man all right let's hear it <laughs> so um i've got some canadian friends oh i think i do know this one but i think okay. well let me hold on i think i know where this is headed let me put let me put it okay. that way yeah so i have some canadian friends and um a good a good friend of mine uh also a pa boy um good buddy of mine, Wade, he, he went on a hunter host deal. So as I understand it, if you're a, you're a resident, uh, in certain provinces, you know, in, in Canada, once every three years, you can bring a U.S. hunter up and host a hunt on private ground. I think, it, I think it'd be, it can be public too, mm -hmm. public or private, but, um, Nonetheless, they have to fill out all the paperwork and request Canada, hey, do you mind if I bring a non-resident up here to hunt? And and he's going to hunt with me. Um, but, you know, I get to be the hunter. And so anyways, a friend of mine was like, yeah, have you ever have you ever chased moose or uh, Canadian, you know, mule deer before? And I'm like, no. And he's like, you know, well, why not? And I'm like, Pfft. I can't afford it, you know? Right. Like, this is too much money. I mean, it's a dream hunt, but, uh, and I know moose meat is really, really good, and, and I'd love to do it sometime. And uh, he's like, well, why don't you come up and hunt my place? So I went online, Dude. I filled out my information and got my Alberta, uh, my Canada, my, my win card, as they call it. And then, uh, so now I'm waiting on him to fill out his paperwork, and if he gets approved, 
um, then I'll be able to purchase my license and um, nice. I'll be heading to Alberta to chase moose with my bow. Dude, that is like so. When we talked the last time, I think we did talk about that that was a possibility, but it sounds like this yep. is like it has progressed to like now. As long as boxes get checked, it's looking like a pretty a pretty fair chance it's going to happen. Yeah, Dude, yeah, that's um, insane. Man. So, yeah, so it's um, you know it's one of those things where um, if I'm successful on those hunts, I'll have a lot of meat, which will be good. If I'm not successful, I'll be eating ramen noodles for the next like two years. Yeah, <laughs> trying to reimburse my funds from this from these hunts. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I think that's a good segue, man, into like some of the stuff we wanted to talk about because you know one of the things I think you know you and I you know share on this you know during the course of the podcast is you know either all the places that we are, are hunting or have hunted or want to go hunt and, and stuff like that and um, you know it's uh, it's one of those things where you know we are willing to make whatever sacrifices to try to make those things happen and so forth. We're no different than anyone out there listening in in, in terms of you know, ability to go make these things happen. It's, you know, save money for tags and travel and, and all that stuff, you know, um, you know, sometimes you maybe have a friend that's someplace that can maybe you know, like get you on some ground or, or whatever, you know, those, those, those types of things. But like the fundamentals of how we have to go about doing it aren't different than any, anybody out there that, that's listening. And so I think I, I thought it'd be kind of cool if we just kind of walk through what our approach is when we start planning a hunt, because mm-hmm. I think sometimes people are a little intimidated by trying to, you know, put these things into motion um, you know, and, and, and maybe, you know, kind of fail at the starting line, so to speak, because it's, you know, they, they get hung up on maybe how much it's going to cost. And that's a good thing to get hung up on because look, you know, it's like, I've always said, it's like John and I aren't Rockefeller. So it's not like we've just got all the cash in the world to throw around, but if you prioritize yeah, no, something, no Vanderbilt's in my family. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so it's like, if you prioritize and stuff like, you know, and kind of set a plan in place, you know, maybe you have to plan it out a year, two years, three years in advance, whatever it is, you can make, make those things happen. So I thought it'd be kind of cool if we walked through what those, those things look like. And I can kind of, I guess, you know, start, I guess, how I, how I start, you know, for me and then John, we can kind of go back and forth of like, if at that phase, if you do things differently or not or whatever, or how you do things differently. Before we continue our conversation, let's talk about wicked tree gear saws. Hardcore deer hunters need tools that can keep up. We don't baby our gear and take on whatever mother nature happens to dish out during our hunts. Check out wicked tree gear, hand saws and pole saws at wickedtreegear.com. Use the promo code truth to save yourself 20% on your next purchase and get a hand saw that's tough enough to work as hard as you hunt. And now back to the show. But for me, when I, when I first start, I guess it's, you know, being the family guy and stuff like that, I have to kind of take into consideration, um, what my family can withstand to a degree. Um, and, and that's not just, you know, financially, but that's also just the time wise of me being away from, away from home, you know, cause I have a family, you know, a daughter and, and a wife and, you know, she works as well and stuff like that. So, you know, my time away, you know, not just, you know, is it, you know, how much is it going to cost for me to go do these things, but how much extra stress am I putting on the house, you know, my wife and so forth. So one of the things that we usually do, you know, before we even start, you know, I start even mapping out where I'm going to go is I usually try to pick like a time frame that, that, that I want to go. Right. And that'll usually kind of tell me, you know, you know, maybe what state or what species I might go after. So last year I knew I wanted to do an elk hunt. And so I knew it was going to be in September, you know, and I know I like to hunt the rut, you know, in, in Ohio. So I know there's always time I want a, a lot for that. Um, and so what we usually do to try to lessen the stress on the house is we'll, I'll plan those out, you know, in advance, like a year in advance. And I'll know that I'm going to be going to a certain place for a certain period of time. So I'll kind of lock down, like I'm going to do last year it was Montana for two weeks. And I know it's Ohio for like nine days and I'll sit with my wife and we'll kind of figure out what those, the timing of those trips are. And then what we usually do, you know, we have great support in terms of our family. Uh, her parents are, you know, are, are retired at this point. And so we usually then try to have her mom come down and spend those two weeks with my wife and my daughter. Um, she gets, they get to spend some time with, you know, my wife with her mom and our daughter with her grandmother for those two weeks and just kind of have a good time together. And she comes down and helps take care of some things. And she loves doing it because she loves spending time with her daughter and her granddaughter. And so it kind of works out for everybody. So that's one of the things that I do or that we do collectively, I guess, as a family to try to, you know, lessen the brunt of the the load that my wife has to bear, like when I'm, I'm gone for, um, you know, extended period of time to hunt. So that's kind of like my, my first step, John, are you, are you kind of in the same boat? I mean, do you have like, what considerations do you make around, around that type of stuff? Yeah. Um, 
so my wife, she she stays at home. Uh, we've got three three children under the age of fifteen. Um, so she stays. Uh, she's she's a stay at home mom, um, and she uh, she rocks it, man. Uh, she holds down the fort, you know, whenever I'm gone. Um, and she's uh, she's been a rock star champion, you know, for me to to really tackle some of the career decisions that I've made over the years, especially the last couple of years. And, um, she's been a huge, uh, huge asset to Arrow Wild. Um, uh, she does a lot of the bookkeeping and a lot of the email correspondence kind of stuff between the team and sponsors and stuff. So she's been a huge help there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think planning, ma- planning ahead for when you're going to be gone, uh, making sure you've got that plan in motion, whether it be setting up kennels for your pets or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. um, but you know, I was getting ready to say kennels for the for the kids. <laughs> I almost said that. Yeah, that would be helpful. Um, but you know, kennels for the pets. You know, or or the you know or, or the kids. Or it just kids, depends. Yeah, but um, it's okay, no child services here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just uh, but getting all that set up, and then I think the next step for trying to ensure uh, success on on the hunt is it's never too soon to start making a checklist, a pack list, yeah. a gear list. You know, kind of things that you're going to need on the hunt. Uh, never sit down a day or two days before you're actually packing because you'll get halfway to your trip or you'll get on your trip and you're like, I forgot chapstick. I forgot toilet paper. I forgot, you know. Yeah. Um, so I think starting on the list ahead of time um, because weeks and weeks after you start, you'll still be adding a few more items, you know, to that checklist. Um, I found out that the hard way uh, Montana last year. Yeah. But um, the uh, other thing like say with the Kentucky property, I do have some, uh, well, I should, I, I know the terrain. Um, I know the general areas that I want to, I want to be in. Um, but what I'm going to do this summer is like June. Well, when I go down for Turkey season, I'm going to bring a couple of trail cameras and set them up and start some mineral sites. The landowner, his job is basically going to be, Hey, here's this bag of mineral on this sometime in this week. I need you to go dump it out for me, swap out these SD cards, mail me, you know, mail me the original. And here's a blank one to put in there. Um, I'm going to go back down there again, probably in July and probably go ahead and hang at least go ahead and get a couple of sets trimmed out and hung one weekend. Mm -hmm. Um, And then that'll be, you know, my, my first couple of sets, depending on winds, I'll Mm -hmm. try to go ahead and get me a North wind or a predominant North wind, a predominant South wind, a um, couple of sets hung and then I'll come back in September and at least I'll have a starting point, you know, right. uh, and I ultimately might end up having to tear down and move uh, to different spots, but at least I'll be somewhat ahead of the game. Um, so that's how I'm going to prepare for that hunt. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. I think it's a good point you make as far as, you know, it's don't be afraid to choose a spot depending on what you're availability is to you know to learn about some of these places don't be afraid to choose a spot that you might have a friend that can help you out with some boots on the ground stuff you know it's like for me for this past year you know my the the hunt i did in ohio was with with our buddy chad um from exodus and you know i went out and did a day's worth of scouting with him in you know august i guess it was you know we were kind of laying some plans and and, uh, and and so forth but he lives a lot closer to it than i than i do so like any all the truck cameras that we had hung and stuff like that like he was going down and checking them and sending me truck camera pictures and stuff like that so i could kind of keep updated as to what was going on just because you know for me it was a 10-hour drive to get there um you know so it's don't be afraid to kind of pick a spot where you might have a little bit of help if you're concerned about your ability to get there and learn the terrain and and, and know know enough information you know to actually hunt it effectively when you when you do get there so I think it's a good kind of segue into, you know, e-scouting and, and just how we kind of like take a property and, and, and start to look at it. You know, for me, a lot of the land that I'll hunt whenever I do a travel hunt is 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 public. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times the, another good example is, you know, hunting Ohio this past year or the, or the year prior. And I'll, maybe I'll take the year prior as a better example because. I really didn't know anything about that piece of property and I didn't have, I didn't have a buddy who lived near that necessarily that could give me any pointers. Um, you know, so what I really was, you know, kind of relegated to was taking, it was doing a bunch of e-scouting in, in advance and, and really just kind of focusing in on what I could tell from, you know, topo maps and aerial, aerial imagery, you know? And so for that, there's a bunch of different tools out there, whether you use, 
um, you know, Google Earth or whether, you know, I've been using the Onyx uh, Hunt uh, app on my phone. I know, I, I believe there's um, a Huntera app that you can use as as well um, that's a, a, on a mobile device. So there's a couple of different, you know, ways you can kind of get that information. Um, and then I just kind of start looking at public land boundary lines and, and stuff like that and figure out what chunks of public land are going to be, you know, large enough maybe or small enough because sometimes the smaller pieces get get overlooked. Yeah, you know, I also want to kind of take into consideration what's in the surrounding area. You know, I, I really kind of, I really like areas that are kind of like public land areas that are out in rural settings, because um, a lot of times the land that's around that are is is large enough tracts of land where people who live near there end up hunting their own property and don't hunt the 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 public land necessarily. You know, and the other thing I'll look for whenever I'm using my e scouting is I'm really kind of also I'm not so much. I'm trying to learn a couple things. I'm looking at terrain features to kind of help drive me to places where I think is, are going to either funnel deer or that deer will use to travel. So whether it's benches or whether it's, you know, points of a ridge where, where there might be bedding or whatever the case might be. But what I'm really also looking for in that is I'm looking for anything that's telling me where there are like hiking trails and stuff like that that people might use or camping areas and stuff like that that might have people nearby. Um, the reason being is what I'm trying to do really is I'm trying to take away any places where I think there's going to be easy human intrusion and really just kind of cutting those off my list to begin with. Like I'm not even going to go look at those because I'm just anticipating that there's going to be easy ways to get to all those spots, which means there's going to be a lot of hunters there. And if not, there's probably going to be, have been used for other non-consumptive, you know, outdoor, you know, enthusiasts. So hikers, bikers, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of what I look for, you know, if it's public land or that's not near farmland and so I don't have any ag fields or ag to play off of for a, for a bed to food kind of pattern, then I'm going to look for, you know, clear cuts, you know, that, ha- that are relatively young. So anything probably from like a year to three, maybe four years old are probably the things I'm going to look for. I know on the Onyx Hunt app, there's an overlay you can use for the forestry service that'll show you where the newest cuts are on public land and stuff like that. So you can kind of figure that out because that's really a public land food plot by all, you know, for all intents and purposes. So when it comes to kind of like e-scouting, that's really kind of my, I guess, high level approach. I kind of I nerd out and get more into it and, you know, and, 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 and st- spend a lot of time on the, the maps. Um, but really I'm dropping pins uh, before I even get there because it's going to reduce the amount of time that I'm going to have to spend boots on the ground to kind of learn what I need to learn to give me a fighting chance when I get there during hunting season. So that's kind of my approach to East County. I don't know, John, if you do anything differently, if, if it's, if it's the same, how you approach it. Yeah. Well, you know, and it's kind of similar to like when I first moved out here to Iowa, um, the first couple of nights when I should have been unloading boxes, I was waiting till last light and I was driving around and looking at some of the ag fields Mm -hmm. and just seeing how the deer were utilizing those ag fields, whether they were coming or going from my property to other people's properties and, um, you know, topos are fantastic. Um, but man, boots on the ground, mm-hmm. observe, you know, in the summer, nobody says that you can't, you know, go on to this piece that you're wanting to hunt, go there before the season opens up, hang an observation set in a tree stand from a far distance with a set of binos or a spotting scope and just watch. Mm-hmm. And, you know, watch the way the deer utilize the properties and the neighboring properties, um, you know, if you're in an area where there's crop rotation, um, year to year, it's totally different. You know, what was beans last year is corn this year, and what was corn is now beans. And so the deer move, the, they move and transition, uh, you know, differently. Yes, there's going to be those core areas that are constant core areas or maybe constant, you know, bedding areas. Um, but food travels, you know, is, is, is huge. Um, in Kentucky in particular, um, we had last time I was there two years ago, we had a ton of success with a lot of big bucks uh, transitioning from the timber uh, coming out into the alfalfa at last light. Mm-hmm. And they would feed across the alfalfa field to the next section of, uh, of bedding where there was a pond. You know, we want, we thought about setting up by the pond, but by the time they made it to us, it was dark. So we, we took the fight to them, but we couldn't go in the timber because even though it was daylight in the alfalfa fields, it was dark in the timber. Um, so we, you know, we cut it and kind of played it on that, on that field edge. Uh, so as soon as they came out of the timber into the alfalfa, you had about five or 10 minutes of daylight or your know, shooting light still left. And, mm-hmm. and that's, and ultimately that's what ended up messing me up on my hunt down there two years ago was the smaller bucks went ahead and fed out into the alfalfa and the big boy stayed just about five foot inside the timber tree line and 
till it got dark. Yeah, yeah, getting dark, getting dark deered, which is easy to do, man. I mean, I think you made a good point with you know the boot with the boots on the ground. You know, for me, it's like when I do my e scouting and I've kind of checked off all these places that I don't want to scout because I think there's going to be human intrusion in those places. Um, I do the same whenever I go and do a, a boots on the ground scout. If I walk into a place that I think is going to be good and there's like a bunch of you know uh, old scent wicks hanging in, in a tree or if there's a bunch of fluorescent things that it kind of looks like someone made a trail up to like a place where they might place a stand or something like that i don't even walk any further i just turn around and go back out and go to the next spot um chances are if it's you know that noticeable when you walk in with human sign it's chances are someone's going to probably be there or have been there right before you've gotten there um so i'm not interested in, in that spot so i kind of do that and kill that quickly um the other thing i think john that you made a good point in terms of boots on the ground and you're talking about food a little bit is like have in mind what time of year you're going to be there, what time of the hunting season you're going to be there. So you can kind of understand potentially what food is going to be in play. You know, it's like, are you going to be there in mid October, you know, or during the period of time where, you know, a lot of acorns are going to be dropping and stuff like that. And that the food sources are going to be, you know, kind of getting dark, you know, you'll get dark deer if you are near those food sources or maybe those clear cuts um, that act as public land food sources because deer are laying further into the timber because they got all the food that they need in there, you know? So, think about what type of food and variety of food is in the area that you're in and how that might play and where you need to be hunting or how you need to be hunting whenever, when you get there. I think the part that we kind of missed a little bit, man, and you know, not to work backwards necessarily is like, is how we pick the place that we're going to hunt. Cause I think sometimes people just, you know, it's like, well, how do I know where to go hunt or what County I should be hunting in or what zone I should be hunting in and stuff like that. And, you know, my answer to that is, is, you know, Google is your friend. Um, and that was exactly how I kind of <laughs> picked the spots that I go. Um, you know, I, I set a criteria for what I, what type of hunt I want to get into. It's like, do you want to hunt, you know, uh, mountain, mountain ground? Do you want to hunt, you know, places that have, you know, large ag, you know, ag food sources? Do you want to hunt big woods? Do you want to hunt? So kind of figure out like what type of hunt you want to go for. And then, you know, set your expectation or set, you know, your level of experience you want to have, like what type of deer do you want to have an opportunity to chase? You know, what caliber do you want to have an opportunity to chase? Um, and then, you know, it's, the information is pretty easy to kind of go on and find, you know, the different counties and the different States, uh, like the Boone and Crockett scores. If you're looking for certain, you know, if you want to know that, that a certain area grows, a, you know, has the opportunity or potential to grow a certain caliber of buck, you can find that, you know, but you just, by doing some searching, you know, like big buck counties and stuff like that in, in various States. And that's kind of how I go about it. The next level after that is like, once you kind of hone in on like maybe a County and you want to hone in on a specific piece of public land at that point, I think like the biologists and stuff like that with the different, um, you know, uh, wildlife agencies in, in the various states are super helpful. And they'll usually always kind of turn you on to a, I won't say they'll give you like a tree to climb and you don't want to call them and ask and say, I'm looking to kill big bucks. You know, where should I go? Like you'll probably get shut down pretty quickly. But if you say, Hey, I'm an out of state that's coming in and I'd really like to have a good hunt. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking at these three places, like do your homework before you get a hold of them and say, I'm looking at these three places. Can you tell me, are there any areas that you think might get less pressure than, than others? And they'll usually be pretty fa favorable if someone's done their homework to kind of turn them on to some some possible honey holes. Um, and they're, mm -hmm. they're a super great, you know, resource. We had a friend, um, you know, actually Chad turned me on to a buddy of his that he that he talks to who is a biologist in Ohio. And, you know, definitely tap that guy for, for, for information whenever I'm looking in specific areas that I know he's familiar with. Um, and then don't be afraid to reach out to your buddies that might have hunted in those states or go on forums, you know, hunting forums and ask guys that, you know, that are, are from those states or reach out to dudes that are on podcasts and say, Hey, I'm thinking of hunting the state that you're from. You know, what do you, what do you think? Is there, is there an area I should concentrate on that might have less pressure or whatever? There's all these different resources. I was just, uh, I think the biggest thing is just don't be afraid to ask the question. Um, cause you know, yeah. you'll get, you'll get a lot better response than I think a lot of people think they think they will, especially if you frame the question, right. I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, John, but that's kind of how I go about it. Yeah. Um, you know, utilize, utilize your own personal network. I mean, Chances are, if you look at your phone contact list, you have a very close friend or family member that does not live in your state. Yep. Um, you know, that's another option. Let's say you're going to travel to an area and you want to go scout for a couple of days. Hey, Uncle Fred, can I come stay with you this weekend? You know, and then at least you've got a free place to stay and, and hopefully Fred will feed you. So that's one option. Um, but like you said, if anybody thinks that DNR guys don't know where the deer are, hmm. you are poorly mistaken. Yeah, they know. Where <laughs> Some of my buddies back home, we called them I, as a former cop. 
this is a term of endearment, but we, we used to call the guys back home. We called them possum cops. <laughs> um, those guys, like they, they're awesome deer hunters. They know where the deer are. You know, one of my buddies, he'd call me, he's like, Hey, I'm like, you know, what are you doing? He's like, I'm sitting on the side of the road right now, just clocked out. And, but I don't want to, you know, head home yet. And I'm like, Oh man, I'm sorry to hear. I, I just assumed there was problems at home. Right. He's like, no, I'm, I'm watching this giant buck on this hillside. You know what I mean? So, um, <laughs> They know, I mean, they know, they know where the stuff's at. So that's another, another option. Um, if you're going to do the public land, it's not a bad thing. Maybe to reach out to the local guy and say, Hey, you know, you've been, you know, how, how does that, does that piece of walk in, does it get hammered mm -hmm. during early archery season? And, um, you know, is there a piece of public ground that doesn't get hit very hard? And I mean, they'll, they'll let you know, yeah. um, like you mentioned, the big buck stuff. Uh, I believe there's even some apps on some yeah. of the uh, some of the devices that even have that overlay, yeah. you know, on there as well, and that'll tell you some stuff. My my first response whenever you whenever you first mentioned it was, uh, you know, the best place to find bucks is go where people aren't. Yeah. Um, then again, there there could be nobody there because there's not any deer there. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But also. Yeah, you don't want to go to a piece where there's 50 hunters per, you know, per, you know, acre. Right. Uh, that's no fun either. So, you know, you walk in real quiet um, at dark and then, you know, it gets light and you start seeing orange, you know, 10 feet from you. So yeah. that's not fun. Um, yeah. Utilize your friends. Talk to check out some, you know, some of the podcasts, some of the online forums. Uh, be careful with those. You can get led in a different oh, direction, yeah. you know, yeah. depending on which one it is. But, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, in Iowa, we don't have any deer. So right. don't don't worry about coming to Iowa. No. Yeah, don't, don't bother calling John. <laughs> I'm teasing. There's a, if anybody is interested in coming to Iowa, um, there is some phenomenal public ground. Um, fantastic fantastic public ground um you know of course you're in that once every four year yeah type window if you're coming to archery hunt uh on the preference points uh kentucky i will say that there kentucky has never been known for having excellent public ground um there is some stuff over in the western side of the state the land of the lakes deal that's a quota hunt uh, but they have limited number that they let in there and i've had some guys put in for that hunt and uh and they've taken some pretty nice deer over there before right yeah i think i think one other thing to add about the the, the dnr guys or the you know the biologists that work for these different agencies i think the other thing that they can help you with too beyond just kind of helping you understand what might get pressure or if there's an area that's holding good or that holds good deer you know historically or whatever is if you're unfamiliar with the food that's going to be in that area, like what's going to be available at different times of years, especially sure. on like public ground and stuff like that, those guys are the guys that will be able to tell you what's going to be in season and out of season during the different phases of, of the hunting season. That's their biologists. That's what they do. You know, that's, they, they monitor yeah, that you, stuff. You, you know, is there a bunch of white oaks on that property? You know, did you guys have a big mass crop last year? If it, the answer is no, chances are they're going to have a killer mass crop this year, you know? So, right. yep. Good points. Yeah. So the one thing we didn't cover yet, man, is like the also important topic of like, how the hell do you pay for this stuff? Right. I mean, that's the question, like, cause that's the first thing that people yeah. usually like encounter and they're like, man, I can't, you know, I'm not able to afford that. Or that seems really expensive. So I think, I think, yes, all things cost money, right? But they don't have to cost a, a fortune to have a, a, a really good hunt. You know, I've had really good hunts in Ohio. I mean, depends on how you define good hunt. It was a tough hunt this year in Ohio, um, but it was still a good hunt. Um, and it wasn't terribly expensive, right? So, I mean, you, of course, want to look at your different, you know, I think John brought up a good point as far as like when you, you know, in passing mentioned the preference points for Ohio, you have to take into consideration like how, how easily can I get a tag, right? How easy is it to get a license? Is it over the counter? Is it a, is it a draw? You know, how many pre preference points do I need? So some take more planning than others. Like for instance, for me, it's like, I'll plan to be in Iowa, not this, this hunting season, but the following. And I've been buying my press preference points for several years to know that that's when I want to go out. So I've been planning that one long term. Um, but for me, you know, I, yeah. I, I go to Ohio because it's the bordering state for me. Um, and it's it's not a terribly expensive tag to get. And they have really good deer. So it fits all that criteria for me. Um, and how I kind of save for it is, you know, I, I actually use a, a digital uh, tool to save for these things. And it's it's literally just like a hunting fund that I have. It's called Digit. 
Um, you know, you can email me or send me a, a, a message on Facebook or whatever, and I'll send you a link for it if you if you don't if you can't find it. And it's literally an app for my phone. I connect it to my um, I connect it to my bank account, and what it does is it runs you know nerd talk here real quick. It runs an algorithm over my over my my banking um, deposits and debits. So it understands over the course of time, it'll look at like a year's worth of history and it'll understand over, over the course of a year that I have influx of, of money come in at certain periods of a month and I have huge you know, decreases in money at certain periods of the month, right? That kind of coincide with getting paid and then paying like mortgage payments, car payments and, you know, tuition, um, you know, uh, college loans and so on and so forth. And then it basically then figures out each month what you need to live, what you need to pay your bills. And so what it does then is it, it over the course of a month, it knows how much money you can take out of your bank account that you won't feel or notice, and then just puts it into this account, right? And it's all done through an app. So I so it'll know like during a certain part of the month that's like you know, it might be tighter than other parts of the month because say maybe I have my mortgage payment and my car payment go out at the same time, right? So it knows this time of the month is slim. So then it won't take any money out at that point, but it knows like two weeks from now, Clint gets paid and he doesn't have any major bills coming up for another three weeks, uh, which will hit the next pay cycle. So we can take some money out of his account these two weeks and put into this, this savings account for him that he won't even notice is gone. And so that's what I use to save for any of my hunts because I literally don't feel it. And then whenever I, when I go to buy, you know, my tags or do anything like that, you know, it's the money is sitting there in a pool for me to go. Yep. I'm ready to transfer this now to my checking account. And now I can pay for all the things that I need for my, for my hunting trip. So that's kind of how I save to make sure that I'm kind of always making sure that I'm prioritizing, you know, um, being able to take a hunt, John, I don't know if, how you kind of make all that happen, but that's how I make the magic of the, of the money happen for that. Yeah. Um, if I ran an app like that and looked at the influx of going in and going out, uh, mine's going to come up in the red. Uh, I think tax time, tax return is probably the only time I have a huge influx. Right. Uh, it's a, it's a huge outflux. Yeah. Yeah. That. Um, no, I mean, you know, and that's the thing, like budgeting these hunts in, um, you know, sometimes you catch a lucky break and, you know, you line, you know, you land a piece of a piece of ground to hunt. Um, Iowa to come into Iowa as a non-resident is expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm fortunate that I live here and it's, um, so I don't have that expense. Kentucky is moderately cheap over the counter. Um, it's not terrible. Right. Uh, it's probably on the line with, um, you know, Ohio or something like that, you know, 150 bucks somewhere, give or take somewhere around there. Right. Over the counter tags. Um, so not, not totally hateful. But here's the thing that I, I, the way I look at hunting license, um, anytime I'm buying a license out of state, you know, yes, that's the fee that it costs to come to hunt an animal. But I also look at it as like Kentucky, that is my $150 donation to fish and wildlife conservation for the state of Kentucky. Yeah. So um, knowing how they allocate the money and it's going to the right place. Uh, I've never, ever, ever, ever complained about the price of a deer tag. Yeah. Um, so I think that's one way to look at it. And I'm not saying that it doesn't, it doesn't feel differently in your wallet, <laughs> right? Uh, but it doesn't sting as bad in your heart, you know, if right. you know that you're having to spend a little bit of extra money um, right. on a tag. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, and for me, I literally, dude, I I'm old school. Like I save my pennies and nickels and change out of my pocket as long as my boys don't come steal it off the nightstand, <laughs> right. it makes it into a jar. I do, I do that. Um, but I also just kind of budget year to year. Like, yeah. Hey, I've got uh, $500, you know, to throw it license or whatever. Right. Um, and I just kind of mentally prepare for that. Right. I mean, there's other ways you can cut costs too. It's like, you know, for me, you know, like a big thing that, that I do, it's like, I, I typically don't stay in, in like hotels or anything like that. It's like, I'll, I'll camp, or, you know, you know, Chad and I slept in a pool behind trailer for nine days in Ohio and it cost us, you know, whatever it was, five bucks a day for the, for the campsite, you know what I mean? At a campground that we parked the trailer at, 
Um, I've slept in my truck before, you know, to do to do a hunt and stuff like that. So I think, you know, if, if you want to make it happen, there's ways to kind of reduce the cost, you know, make, take all your food along, pre-cook it, throw it in cool, freeze it, throw it in coolers and take it along. So you're not, you know, eating throw out every evening, glacier cooler. throw it in your glacier cooler. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> Nice, nice product placement there. <laughs> um, so it, I think there's a bunch of different ways that you can that you can get around reducing the cost. You know, for me, it's like nine days of hunting in Ohio. I think after gas, tolls, no, you know, traveling. You know, one thing you can do, of course, is try to hunt with a buddy. You know, and someone to kind of split some of the cost with, which is always nice. Uh, for me, unfortunately, I'm usually you know riding solo at least to at least to a meetup spot to meet up with everybody or whoever I'm going to hunt with. Um, you know, I think I was all in maybe. 500 bucks on like the entire tag, you know, and food and everything for the Ohio trip. So, I mean, for a good hunt for nine days, I mean, that's, that's reasonable, you know, and in the peace of mind and the, um, I guess the mental relaxation that I get from being in a tree stand for nine days in Ohio, Ohio, I don't know that I can put a price tag on that. So for me, it's well worth, it's well worth it. Uh, the, the mental, Mm -hmm. the mental relaxation, but man, I think that's it, dude. I think we pretty much covered. Is there anything else for, uh, for planning a hunt that, uh, that, that we missed I can't think of anything off the top of my head at least from like the high level stuff we could get into all the granular stuff but you know if anyone has any questions they can of course reach out to us uh, and we'll be happy to answer anything but I think that that's like at the high level you know that's kind of like the basics of how I think we approach things sure yeah 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 I mean that's um, that's that's pretty much the gist of it I mean like you pointed out I mean you don't have to stay in hotels um, you know Jesse and I we last year in Montana we, we stayed in tents so yeah. Um, we just, I brought extra water and washcloth and bar of soap and some shampoo and, yep. you know, Hey, you're out in nature, yep. you know, become one with it, embrace it. Yeah, exactly. Got my birthday suit and <laughs> scrubbed up, you know? Exactly. And if you can't do that, man, you know, you just take some, take some of the, the wipes along, take a little bum bath. You know what I mean? It's like, that's it. A little bum, <laughs> a little bum bath. Never hurt anybody. <laughs> oh, There's another name for that, but I'm not going to say it. Yeah. We're on the, we're, we're staying PC and, um, yeah, uh, well not, not so much PC, yeah. but we're staying, you know, cuss fairly cuss free. So yeah. I'll leave it out, but yeah. yeah. I, yep, there's uh, there's definitely ways you can do it. If you've ever stopped into a gas station bathroom and taken a bath, then it's the same thing. So yeah, exactly. And that's always an option. Yeah, you know, that's it. If you're driving, if you're driving into town to get something to eat or something, and you see a gas station, go inside that Joker. You know, right. they got hot water, they got soap, clean up. You know, yeah, exactly. You won't be the first one. You won't be the last to do it. But, uh, no, guaranteed. Yeah. But before we... Uh, that's like, you you made a good point, though, Clint. I mean, if you want it, you'll do it. If yeah. you want it bad enough, you'll do it. You know, you know, I had a conversation with a guy one time. He's like, man, he's like, I'd love to be able to travel and do some hunts. I just can't afford it. As he's wearing $150 jeans, $400 boots, yep. smoking premium cigarettes. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm like, hey, you know... Cut cut down to some GPC cigarettes and you know and just get some regular Wranglers and right. you you're halfway there to your tag right there and, yeah. and you know it well heck just don't yeah. buy those blue jeans and you just bought your tag right so exactly between the boots and the blue it, jeans it'll happen you can make some sacrifices that's just it man it's like it's if, if you you know whether you think you can or you can't you're you're right. You know, it's one of my favorite, one of my favorite quotes. And it's very true when it comes to hunting. It's like, if you think you can't afford or you can't figure out how to make a hunt happen, um, then, then you won't be able to. And that's okay. If it's, if it's not, if it's not important enough to kind of prioritize and, and, and give it that attention, then that's fine. That's to each, to each their own. But for those of you out there, you know, and I can pretty much probably say with certainty, most of all the folks that, that listen to us. Um, on this show, you know, ramble on about deer hunting. Like these are the kind of folks who who do want to get it done. So it's a, if it's been something you've been thinking about, you know, here, you know, John and I just kind of shared a couple ways that we that we look at it. Um, you can make it happen. You know, I think you absolutely owe yourself uh, to do it. It's you know, and there's a there's a feeling of accomplishment when you do it too. It's one of the coolest things. Um, whenever you plan a hunt and you go do it, and you even if you don't get anything at the end of it, it's just like you set a goal, you met it. Um, you got to go experience something new um, and have these experiences either, you know, by yourself or with, with a guy or, you know, or two or that you're hunting with. Um, and those things will last forever. Um, and you can't put a price on those and you'll be very glad that you did, but that's um, right. But uh, with, with well, the, go ahead. And, and what I was going to say in another year uh, or another reason for me uh, kind of going big this year, um, 
I'm not one of those people that like, it's usually like, Hey, by the way, it's Valentine's day. I'm like, Oh, it is today. Yeah. You know, uh, I don't, I, for whatever reason, I don't look at that kind of thing and, and I don't pay attention to birthdays and, and that kind of stuff. But, um, I will be the ripe age of 40 years old in mm-hmm. about two weeks. So oh, this is my 40th year. Um, maybe it's the halfway point. I don't know, but, uh, um, right. Nonetheless, that's another reason why I'm kind of going, trying to go a little big this year. Um, yeah. Kind of celebrate my 40th this year. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Well, happy, happy birthday or happy early birthday. I'll be, I'll early be hit. birthday. Yeah. I'll no, be hit. Yeah. You wait two weeks. It's not my birthday yet. I'm still 39. Damn it. Yeah, exactly. It's like, don't put that evil on me. <laughs> yeah. I'll be. Don't I'll, be aging me. Yeah. I'll be hitting that milestone myself here in, in April. So we'll, uh, we'll be the, uh, the 40 club then at that point, which the will 40 be. 40 club. Yeah, we're gonna actually change the name of the podcast to 40, 40 Club and Saggy Balls. Yeah. That's what we're gonna call it. It's, yeah. It has a nice ring it's to 40 it. It's 40-something. Yeah, 40-something. Dad bods. Dad bods. <laughs> we're actually gonna change the format of the show, and it's gonna be nothing about dad bod workouts. How's that? There you yeah, go. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, before it gets any weirder, we should probably go ahead and shut this thing down. Uh, yep. Thanks, everyone out there for listening. As always, you know, we appreciate you guys uh, hanging out with us, listening to us, uh, you know, entertaining us and listening to us talk deer. We, you know, appreciate you guys' support and, uh, and downloading the podcast. So uh, until next time, man, we'll get out of here. Yep. Hey, and hey, remember, truth. You go to wickedtreegear.com, techamani.com, glaciercooler.com. Use the code TRUTH, T-R-U-T-H, save 20%. Nailed it. All right, folks, that is a wrap for today's show. A big thank you to all of you for listening. As always, John and I are very appreciative that you have spent, or choose to spend a little bit of your day listening to us talk deer hunting, so appreciative of that. Also, if you haven't yet, uh, head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating. That would be awesome. And while you're there, be sure to subscribe to the podcast to make sure that we can deliver uh, each and every podcast straight to your mobile device. And before we shut this thing down, we need to give a big shout-out to our partners that continue to help us make this podcast possible. Wicked Tree Gear, Exodus Outdoor Gear, Tecamani Seed, Glacier Coolers, Ramcat Broadheads, and Trophy Taker Rests. And until next time, we'll see y'all. On my heels makes me proud, makes me steal. I could show you through the door. I ain't welcome anymore. Long time coming, if it all. It takes a special no one to call a fall. Damaged heads, broken letters. Analyze yourself in numbers, but I gotta get away from here. Gotta get away from here. Oh, 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 oh.